if I just go through a little bit about who Eto World is to, to, to start with. <clears throat> um, so we're, we're a, a UK based SME and we solve transportation challenges across the globe for millions of travelers uh, every day by delivering real time transit data feeds and a platform for transit agencies and operators. Uh, and effectively, um, we really, our mission in life really is, is, is to deliver transit data as close to the real life traveler experience as possible. Um, you know, we all, we all in our cars expect our sat navs to work perfectly, um, but, but, but actually providing that level of, of kind of passenger experience um, when you're navigating a public transport system um, is actually quite challenging sometimes, particularly in an unfamiliar city. So really what we're, we're aiming to do here is, is, to, is to deliver data to journey planners um, that, that's as close to the real life travel experience as possible. And really we do this in two ways. I mean, we, we serve the, the uh, journey planning market um, and, and this is made up of some of the largest mapping companies in the world, such as, as Apple and Google. Um, and then our second market really is, is a, through the cities, authorities and operators where we're, we're really sort of, uh, helping these uh, organizations um, open up their, their, their transit data um, through a, a complete cloud-based system for managing passenger information. Um, to give in a sense of, of the kind of clients we work with um, around the world, there's, there's a number of global journey planners who we work with very closely, not just in, in the UK, but, but also around the world. Um, we also work with a, a large number of, of uh, public transport operators, and then we also work on the, on the lo lowest uh, so group here on, on the slide, we, we work with the Transport Department for Transport, Transport for West Midlands, uh, Cambridge, and, and another, a number of other um, transport authorities. So what does this mean from an open data perspective? Well, in the work that we do for journey planners, um, we're a large consumer of open data. Um, so, so, you know, we, we have a lot of experience using open data and, and, and some of the challenges and experiences that come from that. Uh, and then really the work we do with cities, authorities and operators, we're, we're really helping organisations here publish open data. So again, we have quite a lot of experience on the other side of the equation, if you like. Um, so, you know, we, we, we have quite a lot of interesting experience um, in, in both fit in both camps, if you will. In terms of our experience is um, opening, <clears throat> providing open data to, to, to service providers like Google and Apple. Um, what we do is we, we gather what is often operational data created by operators and, thought, and operators and authorities, um, which effectively is, is sourced often through their, their, their kind of um, logistics systems and, and fleet, fleet management systems. Um, it's data that's, that's never really been at source um, uh, created for, for, for highly detailed uh, human navigable information. So we do a lot of transformation work by gathering and enhancing both the static and real-time data um, and working with many modes of transportation um, in, 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 in bringing that data into a standardized format. And then once we've gathered this data, we improve and augment it to make sure that we're providing the highest possible data downstream. And this can include provisional, ac provisional accuracy of physical features such as bus stops, um, identifying errors or, or missing data from agencies and fixing inconsistencies. And for real-time data, we have a self-learning algorithm that then accurately um, delivers journey predictions. And then this data is, is all the standardized data we then deliver as a single aggregated feed, um, making it far more far easier for, for organizations to ingest. And we can deliver this data in a range of different standard formats, um, both through API or, or through streamed so fire hose um, formats as well. Why, why does this matter? Well, if we look at the GB bus data set um, as an example, um, we make 140,000 improvements to the raw data every time we send it to, to, to Google and Apple. And put another way, without the changes, an app provider would have 140,000 opportunities to create a bad user experience. So it's so you know it, it's it's really quite key, and, and I think it goes back to what Sam was saying earlier. You know, the quality of the data that that, that can can be used um, in in sort of, um, applications, particularly around travel, for example, it is absolutely key. If you look at the data challenges from a consumer perspective, the quality of the source data is not always fit for journey planning purposes. The schedules don't always record the right level of detail and the real time may not match well to the schedules. 
type of data license matters. Um, we need to be able to reinterpret, improve, and augment the data. Uh, and certainly the, the terms of the licensing is, is very important. Um, and also scaling the solution. I mean, some small developers may need only a few thousand hits through an API, whereas large commercial developers typically need to view the whole network um, typically every 20 or 30 seconds. In terms of the work we do to help organizations publish open data, um, our experience of, of consuming data and improving the quality has been really quite key. Um, before I turn our attention to, to looking at the work we do for transport um, for West Midlands and, and, the, and the DFT, it might be worth just noting the impact that GFL has had on, on the opening up of, of Britain's public transport data. In 2007, they started to open up their data through the Unified API. And, and in the work that we do, we're, we're one of the largest consumers of, of data from the API. And, and it's no accident that CityMapper was founded in London and the data from the Unified API played a, a, a key role for them in their early years. Um, 10 years further on in 2017, Deloitte was commissioned to assess the value of the policy. And the results were really quite startling and, and have been very sort of, um, impactful for, for, for policy, policy makers and, and began to really ask the question, well, could this be extended for the whole of England? And the answer has been the bus open data service, BODS. And, and through this service, um, it's an open data system that it supports operators to publish, index and quality assure their schedule, real time vehicle position and fares data while providing a unified single access point for developers to retrieve data for all buses in England, supporting over 700 operators running 32,000 buses. And it, the scale is, is quite significant because it is the first national open data platform of its kind we believe in the world. Um, and so it's quite an ambitious project. And just to give a sense of, of kind of a little bit around the architecture, um, the, the data publishers, the operators, upload their data into BODS. The, the BODS system then runs a set of quality tests, um, very much looking at the, the, the kind of passenger information aspects of, of the quality of the data. Um, <clears throat> and it reports back to them a, a number of, of quality observations. The operators can then choose to go back and change their source data as a result of the, of the, the observations, or, or they can publish straight if, if they so choose as well. And in, in a future iteration, um, <clears throat> data pub consumers will also have access to, to some of the, uh, the information around the quality of the data that's been, been published um, out. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, the system also has an integrated transport model, which matches the real time to the scheduled data, um, making it much easier to um, <clears throat> publish in a number of different formats. Um, and it also, the, the system also archives the data, um, which again leads to, to some very interesting reporting analytics uh, possibilities, which we'll talk about in a second. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, the, 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 the project's been running uh, for, for a while now. Um, <coughs> al almost all the operators this year will publish their, their, their schedule data. Uh, and a lot of the real time data coming from the big five national operators is already in the system. Um, so so the, there's quite a, a body of data, national nationwide data already existing within the system. And a number of the large um, consumers of data, <coughs> excuse me, such as Move It and City Mapper, um, are beginning to, to access the data and beginning to use it in their live services. That's so already beginning to become quite an interesting resource downstream. So what have we learned so far? So within the, the UK bus or, or GB bus operators, there's, there's a huge heterogeneity. You have some very large operators with thousands of buses. Um, you also have some single bus operators and, and a lot of different smaller bus operators in between. Quite a few of the smaller ones don't have the capabilities and the sophisticated software um, that, that, that the large ones have. Um, but, but overall, there's been a real belief in the importance of, of delivering accurate passenger information. And through the services that BODS can provide, it's helping to level up some of the digital capabilities um, that the smaller operators have. 
There's also general support from stakeholders. <clears throat> the industry has, has generally sort of embraced the willingness to open up the data. There's certainly been some skepticism in, in what is a very traditional uh, sector in, in, in uh, opening up fares data and, and, and vehicle position data nationally. Um, but, but they have embraced it. It's been mandated, but people have got behind it. <clears throat> and we're now beginning to see, excuse me. <clears throat> and we're now beginning to see quite a lot of data coming through. The data quality reports have certainly started to improve the data. And, and I think um, while it's taken a little time to bed down, we're beginning to see the data quality improving over time. As I said before, some of the big um, consumers of data, such as CityMapper, MoveIt, ourselves in, in, for, for, for Google and Apple are beginning to use the data that's coming out of BODS in some quite interesting ways. So what we've really learned sort of a, a key take out is that it's, it's really important to design open data publishing systems that cater for a full industry, allowing both the large and the small operators to publish their data in ways that work for them. And on the consumer side, um, if you were to take the raw public transport data, it, it's quite complex and, and really needs quite specialist knowledge. Um, and through the way that the that the BOD system is integrating the different data sets, uh, it, it's really making it a lot easier for, for more a wider range of, sort of general app developers to use the data without the specialist knowledge and expertise. So it's almost democratizing, if you like, um, the ability for for a wider range of, of, of developer and, and open open data community um, organizations to, to begin to use the data for innovation. <clears throat> and that's particularly important in a deregulated market where there is a lot of heterogeneity in the market. So, so more help really is needed to simplify the access to the data and to, 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 to uh, stimulate innovation. But that's not, the full story and and I think what we're seeing at the moment are, are some significant wider benefits becoming apparent. Um, we spoke a little bit earlier about TFL and, and the economic benefits that, that um, have, have been kind of recorded if you like as, as, as a result of opening up the, the, uh, the data through the unified API. Um, we talked about the passenger experience and certainly more accurate passenger information encourages use of, of, of public transport. Uh, and, and can save time and money for passengers. Perhaps the third aspect is, is not so well, um, is, is a little bit more hidden. <clears throat> Once we have a, a national data set, um, it's quite it's possible then to look at reporting analytics that, that deliver transparency and accountability uh, and digital transformation. There are a number of ways we're working on that um, within the BOD system at the moment. So we're working on an analyzed data service, which, which is really using the, the BODS data um, as a kind of location intelligence service. There are three main audiences for this. One is the regulators. Um, at the moment, um, the Office for Traffic Commissioners, <clears throat> if, if they, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, are alerted um, to, to a potential compliance issue, they, they then send somebody out with a clipboard onto the street to, to, to record and, and monitor the buses. Um, what we're doing through BODS is looking at digitizing that process, <coughs> um, both in terms of making it easy to identify instances of non-compliance and then being able to, to, uh, to, to kind of digitize the compliance checking process as well. The bus operators are benefiting from the reporting analytics as before. There's a, there's a, a, a large range of bus operators in the UK the largest have quite sophisticated performance um, software management systems, but a lot of the smaller and middle-sized ones don't. So to be able to, to access this type of, of insight <clears throat> through data has been absolutely key to them and, and, and kind of uh, digitally transforming um, the, the, uh, uh, what is quite a traditional market. And finally, the local authorities are also benefiting from um, the, the level of, uh, sort of transparency that the data provides. Uh, e even the large sophisticated uh, authorities such as Transport for Greater Manchester um, were saying the other day that, that they don't actually through their own systems have the same <clears throat> level of visibility um, 
that uh, is, is becoming available through BODS. <coughs> um, just to, to, to move to Transport for West Midlands um, for a second, um, part of the work we do for Transport for West Midlands um, is deliver a, a, an open data API. <clears throat> when we started looking at, at, at it, we, we, we um, were well aware of the number of developers using the, the unified API in, in Transport for London, so we didn't want to reinvent wheels. So we asked TfL if we could use their schema on an OpenGov license, um, and, and then so that enabled the, de the, app, the um, developers who, who were working with, with TfL data to seamlessly plug into their services into, uh, into the data av coming available through Transport for West Midlands. <clears throat> and, and what we found here is that, that over time, a, a wide range of developers and, and users have, have um, used the, the uh, Transport for West Midlands API. Um, and that includes not only developers, but also transport planners and, and, and academic researchers. And I think the ODI leads have, have done some, some very interesting work using the data that's become available through it. I think what was fascinating was over time, the single largest consumer of the open data API has actually been TFWM. And, and as they, they began to realize the ease of which they could consume the data, um, they began to use it internally to power not only their BI tools, but also some of their other applications and, and customer facing uh, passenger information systems. I think to distill this down, <clears throat> what we found is Clearly, open data benefits the open data consumers, community and, and consumers. Um, but what is less obvious, perhaps, but, but really very important, is that when you publish open data, the tools and mechanisms used you know, really serve as a forcing function to improve data and internal systems and processes. And that ends up signif delivering significant benefits to the publisher. And I think what, what is interesting over time is that we're beginning to see as BODS um, in increasingly has a very rich and, and, and fairly accurate data set, um, that the, the, the kind of the, the platform can be then used as, as quite a significant catalyst for digital transformation across not only government, but also the, the operators themselves. And so it's going to be very interesting, I think, to see, see how BODS develops over time. I do apologize for my <coughs> my, uh, my my throat at the moment um but thank you very much for listening and uh yeah that, that's uh that, that gives some flavor of of uh, um what we're doing and and how the uh the uh, the open data market in the in the uk for for public transport is beginning to uh, to shape up mike thank you very much that was absolutely fascinating um and unlucky about the the throat we've all been there unfortunately <laughs> but tonight was the night um I mean, first of all i, I mean i, I the, one of the messages i love the most out of that is um the the fact that the the open data that the tfwm is publishing is then the easiest way for them to consume that data for themselves which i think is a, a benefit that is quite often not realize is that actually you can do a lot more internally just by making it so much easier for your own staff to gain access to that to that data it seems like something that that shouldn't be um such a big boon but actually we see it everywhere and it's it that is, that is a really key message um a quick question from me um well actually i've got loads of questions sorry i'm gonna have to just launch in here so uh, you, one of the things you talked about which was really interesting was the challenges as a consumer of open data if you were to try and go um, around to different operators and try and collect that data for yourself you'd be uh, you'd struggle to kind of pull it all together um, i wondered if you could say a kind of a bit more about how the bus open data service makes makes that easier so is it is it is it that it kind of brings it into a sort of unified data model um, what 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 kind of what things does it do to actually help people? Yeah, I I think there's a, there's a number of things. I think what one, as you say, is is the aggregation of the data. So it's bringing it in, um, and then then aggregating into a, a a unified model of of the data, 
Um, the, the, the schedule data and the real-time data quite often don't necessarily match up. Um, the identifiers in the different data sets are sometimes very different. So to make it a lot easier, bringing those data sets together, tying them up together um, is really quite key. Um, you've also got the question of, of operators where, where, where different bus operators operate across different um, local authority boundaries. And, and if you're looking at trying to knit the local authority um, operators together in, into, into kind of regional services or regional data sets, it becomes quite difficult. So again, having everything sort of matched together and, and, and sort of aggregated together makes it a lot easier for, for um, developers to, to actually not have to do any of that work. They can consume the data uh, very, very, very straightforwardly. I think the other thing is around data standards. Um, the DFT had, has has worked very hard with with operators to to define different profiles, um, data profiles for the data that's that's being pushed into BODS, um, and then that's making it much easier on the consumer side for for you know, the very consistent standard and and applied to the data, and and I think through through the way that we're we're kind of pulling all of the data together, we're, we're able then to provide the data out in a number of different formats to developers. So. Um, you know, our, our UK standard is, is transit change for, for static data. Um, we typically use the Siri standards for, for, for real time. Um, but a lot of developers and, uh, and particularly the journey planners actually want the data in the GTFS um, standard, um, which is typically used worldwide for, for uh, journey planning. So again, by, by having the data in a single model and being able to push it out and, and off, offer data consumers a range of different so data formats um, they can use to, to consume the data also makes it a lot easier for the different use cases downstream. Yeah, and I suppose um, there's there's another question around, you, men, you mentioned democratizing, um, and I think that's a really powerful message as well. Um, how do you, uh, well, one question for me, how do you make available the sort of, the information that people need in order to actually use this data because I imagine it's a complex data model. It probably has lots of um, facets to it that require quite a level of domain understanding. How do you um, make that information available, I suppose? Mm -hmm. I think we, at the, at the moment, um, you know, GTFS is, is, a, is a relatively straightforward format, um, but it's still really looking at the data in, in fairly large, large chunks. Um, the there are a number of APIs that enable you to, to kind of um, search for the data in for different geographical reason, re regions, um, but I think there's still a way to go to to to, to completely democratize it. And I think again, looking at, at, at what TFL does, um, their, their unified API does a, a really good job of, of, of enabling so smaller developers to interrogate the data in, in a lot of lot of easy ways. So I think you know we'll have to see how BODS progresses over time. Um, and we, it, we're on a kind of continuum, if you like, and and it's fairly fairly early in the, in, in the journey. Um, but but there you know there's certainly a way to go. But but we you know, the technology is there, the the, the data formats are there openly. Um, so I think it's a question of, of seeing how far it, it goes. So on the topic of um, I suppose democratizing. Um, so Adam has got a question in the chat, which I suppose is about democratizing really the feedback loop on um, improving that data, which is, um, could the data specifically in rural areas be improved um, with something like an Android app that you can, you know, feedback or upload location in real time? Um, quite, quite possibly. I and mean, interestingly, there is now through, through notify.gov, um, um, <clears throat> the facility for data consumers to actually directly feed back to the operators um, issues that they find in the data. So there are already some interesting feedback loops being being um, put in, um, but there's also you know quite a lot that can be done um, through through kind of machine to meet machine. And so yes, I think that there's certainly there are some projects we're working on. For example, looking at, at the the accuracy of um, uh, bus stop data and, and using vehicle position data from from bus operators to see if we can um, to improve the quality of, of the uh, the accuracy of bus stop location data as, using those different data sets. So yeah, I think there's already some 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 work being done on that. Um, so I think it's a mixture of, of potentially machine to machine, but there's also um, there are some human feedback loops directly from consumer 
back to the uh, the publisher as well within the system. Um, Raymond asks in the chat, what arrangements are there for release of ULES and congestion zone traffic type and density data? Do you think this is something that's within the remit, use a similar schema or something slightly different? I think we, at the moment, the, the remit of, of, of BODS is very much of the, the bus open data, public public transport data sets. So we don't deal so much with um, with, with the road traffic data itself. Um, but it is fair to say that that as part of the, the kind of analytics that, that the uh, local authorities are, are looking at, um, using the bus real-time location data as, as probes on the network to understand pinch points in the network um, is, is something that is a use case that they're beginning to look at. Um, but yeah, we, we're, we're very much at the moment with BODS focused on the public transport side rather than the, the, the kind of uh, traffic flow side of, of the general sort of traffic and on the roads. So I guess on that point, um, Ant has a question in the chat, which is BODS is obviously about bus open data, um, which is great. Are there, do, is there any traction on extending that system or those standards to be used across all types of transport? So you know, trains, trams, maritime, um, to really kind of get a benefit of having the whole thing as an integrated system? I think, um... I think certainly at the moment, you know, we are looking at, at local transportation to begin with and seeing whether, you know, the likes of, of um, you know, the system in fact can handle um, local transportation like um, local train service, local, local tram services. In fact, there's, there are one or two operators who are uploading not only their bus data at the moment, but also their local tram data into BODS. So, so the, technically there's no reason why not. Um, I think it's, it, you know, th th there's clearly um, a starting point with bus and we see how it goes but I think also then there's that there are policy implications about how that data perhaps comes into to BODS but I think you know th I think there is a lot of talk around sort of joining up it's sort of joined up data set for, for public transport um, and, and, and local transport and I think it's you know it'll have to see I think how that that, that begins to uh, to play out. And then another question from Raymond in the chat which is as well as doing something like a, I guess an Android app or something where to contribute back, what opportunities are there from um, IoT for registered devices to kind of feed back into that feedback loop? Yeah, it's an interesting question. Um, we haven't looked at that at the moment, um, but it might be an interesting one certainly um, to, to look at. Uh, and then final question from Bill Roberts. Um, the TFL APIs have been around for ages now, getting on for 10 years, and they are widely praised, quite rightly, um, but they're not widely reproduced elsewhere. Um, do you think the procurement or the franchising or the regulation process could be used by government to kind of motivate private operators of public transport to do better? Yeah, I, th I, th I think BODS is, is going to start to do that. I mean, I think the clearest example perhaps is 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 fares and we don't yet because fares data is is kind of the next to be published and and it's not yet openly available in in, in large quantities as it would say but i think um i heard a statistic um not so long ago that there are across both sort of train and, and and bus and public transport there are over 55 million individual fare classes which is is almost more than one per per, per, per member of the uk population um, so, you know, and, and it is a very complex fares structure that we have in the UK for public transport. And I think what will be interesting to see as, as the bus fares data becomes published is whether that actually drives a kind of simplification and a rationalisation of the fare data and, and the fare structures um, to make the data far more easily accessible and, and, and user friendly for, for, for data consumers. So I think that'll be an interesting one to watch. Um, I think the by, by making the data openly available, I mean I think certainly the you know lo looking at what we're doing on highlighting and, and uh, making the observations on on the data quality side, it is beginning to have an impact on how transport uh, operators think about data quality. It's quite a big shift for them because a lot of that data quality work um, historically has been done by, by by local authorities. Some of it still is done at local authority level. But, but I think the, the whole bus act and, and the legislation has really sort of 
push more of the emphasis on and, and the kind of responsibility for data quality on the operators in a way they haven't had before. So I think it is a process. Um, it's it's going to take time, um, but I think with the right digital tools, it's going to be interesting to see how how that the whole kind of platform and system can can begin to uplift quality for for, for data consumers over time. And I'm I'm going to use my host's privilege to ask the final question, which um, which is actually kind of move, like going on from that. If we are going to put more um, uh, more force, I guess, on the operators to do better through the ability to kind of talk about data quality. Um, you mentioned that there are operators with single buses, um, which I never knew. That's that's fascinating, actually. But how do you bring in from the cold, I guess, operators that have very little capability, mm -hmm. um, especially if we're going to expect more from them than even they, they currently have ex have expectations mm -hmm. of? No, I, I, I totally agree. And I think there's been a lot of work done and a lot of consultation and stuff with, with the smaller operators to, to really understand how best to, to simplify the technology and simplify their their interface with the technology um, to, 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 to deliver the data out. Um, so I think, yeah, there are a number of, I mean, I think the making the, 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 uh, the interface is very simple to use, um, free to use. Is, is part of the democratization, if you like, of, of, of the digital tooling um, for the industry and, and to support the smaller operators and give them the opportunity, hopefully, to, to, to kind of um, probably for the first time ever in certain circumstances, um, have access to, to kind of digital tools to, to help support them manage their, their operations um, in, in a more data-driven way. That's great. Thank you, Mike. That was a um, fascinating talk. And thank you again um, to the chat for the excellent questions and Mike for the excellent answers. Um, in, in that case, I think it's uh, the final thing uh, to do is just to, to thank our three speakers again for their uh, really interesting talks uh, and thank the audience for their, um, for their excellent questions. That was a really great set of questions. Um, what I will do as a final a final act is um, just sh show you the the upcoming list of future meetings. Um, so on the fifteenth of April we have talks on inclusivity and open source. On the nineteenth of April we have our regular Risk Five meetup. Um, on the twentieth of May we have open source in space, uh, which is going to be really interesting. And on the seventeenth of June um, we've potentially got some talks on student projects. So that will be like a lightning talk format, including undergrad and PhD students. So once again, thanks very much to our three speakers, Matthew, Sam, and Mike. Um, and thank you everyone for watching. Jeremy. Yeah, thank you. I just add my uh, thanks as chair to our three speakers, three great talks, um, and uh, they will be available for you to tell your friends who missed the live event on YouTube very shortly. Um, and I look forward to seeing you at our future talks i would say inclusivity in open source we've gone for more than just women in open source this year we have three very exciting speakers lined up we're going on the very top this year we're looking for role models and all being well we will have three international chief executives or chairs of global open source organizations to speak to us next month uh, that's a joint meeting with bcs women um, so look out for that one we anticipate it will be very popular thank you all very much uh, the 